Order, please. We'll now move on to oral questions put by members to ministers and we'll conclude at 2.51 p.m. The official leader, the leader of the official opposition. Thank you, Mr. Official Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my first question to the Premier today is about mental health. In addition to listening to the many heartbreaking stories and frightening situations facing many Nova Scotia families who are dealing with, Mr. with uh, mental illness, Mr. Speaker, we've also been reaching out to experts in the field. Dr. Stan Kutcher is one such expert who has laid out a very compelling model for early intervention with our young people. It includes improving mental health literacy, identification of mental health early, and access to mental health services in our schools. He has previously presented his plan to the Minister of Health. I'd like to ask the Premier, will he mandate his Health Minister and his Education Minister to ensure that Dr. Kutcher's plan for school-based intervention is fully implemented in Nova Scotia schools. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, I want to assure him uh, that uh, uh, the Minister of Education and the Minister of Health are continuing to work together to deliver ensuring that we have services across our province. He knows there's been an investment made uh, in uh, a number of uh, programs in the public education system that deal with me uh, adolescent mental health. Uh, that uh, has actually been spearheaded in, uh, by uh, Dr. Kucher uh, when it comes to supporting training for teachers for, for early identification, uh, when it comes to providing uh, the supports uh, that families will require that. We, we continue to work with them. We know there's more work to do. Uh, but I, I do want to uh, tell the Honourable Member we've been very pleased, and I think it's fair to say that uh, Dr. Kucher has been very pleased, uh, that the work and the huge advancement that's taken place in the last two years. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his first supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I do appreciate the Premier's answer. Uh, and he is quite correct. There is good work going on in terms of mental health literacy, identification of uh, mental illness uh, in students early across Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker. But access to health professionals uh, with mental health training in our schools is still a gap in our system. Uh, Dr. Kutcher has uh, proposed a remedy for that. I will table it for the benefit of the House and I will ask the Premier if he will commit to ensuring uh, that our schools have someone with professional mental uh, health training available to students who wish to access it. The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I want to assure him that the Minister of Education, the Minister of Health and the departments are continuing to uh, work together to ensure that those services are in places uh, where uh, Nova Scotians need them. We recognize uh, we have an opportunity in, in the public education system where our children are there for a large chunk of the, of the year, uh, for large parts of the school year day. Uh, that we can provide some of those supports. Uh, what Mr. Kutcher has brought forward has been part of what we look at. We've seen some investment uh, in, in uh, uh, some uh, health programs in schools, health centers in schools. Uh, some are working better than others. We know that. Uh, but we are also looking at to find the best model to ensure that we have those services on the ground when, when they are needed. And Mr. Speaker, I would say to you uh, that uh, that is not just an education issue that uh, I think the Leader of the uh, Opposition has brought forward. It is also one that we need to bring health in to make sure that we do have uh, health care pr providers there when we need them. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, 70 percent of people who develop mental illness uh, show signs of that mental illness before the age of 25 years old. We have an opportunity to be a leader across the country really here in Nova Scotia in the early intervention and early diagnosis uh, of mental illness among young people. Uh, I know the Premier is on his way to a uh, First Minister's meeting next week uh, and I am very hopeful and I will ask him in fact if he will raise the issue of adolescent mental health and how we might uh, take on this great cause in a, in a national way, Mr. Speaker, with the Prime Minister when he sees uh, the Prime Minister next week. And before the Premier answers the question, I will actually table Dr. Kutcher's analysis of how this can be done on a national basis and encourage the Premier to raise it when he gets to the First Minister's meeting. The Honourable Premier. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for the question. I, I would say with the work that is taking place, Mr. Speaker, we are already leading the country. We need more work, though. There's no question. There has to be more work. Uh, we do believe the national government has a role to play in that. I'm very pleased that the Prime Minister has uh, uh, has the, the portfolio for youth. Uh, he's talked about this. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I know we will have a partner uh, under this Prime Minister. I also want to tell the Honourable Member that the Minister of Health uh, nationally, upon her uh, calls around the country, when she was speaking to our Minister of Health, has raised this issue and uh, has assured us, uh, uh, and uh, I know our Minister of Health will assure the members of this House, that it will be on the agenda of health ministers the first opportunity they meet. The Honourable Acting Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Premier has ma maintained that there was more to the tape than the short two minutes when his Chief of Staff outlined the path back to Cabinet for the member from Dartmouth East, and we now know a bit more about what's on that tape. Today, the Chief of Staff can be heard on that tape suggesting that the Premier's office could arrange for a personal services contract for Mrs. Younger. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the Premier, following the meeting between his Chief of Staff in February and Mr. Younger, did he discuss with the Premier a personal services contract for Mrs. Younger? The Honourable Premier. No. The Honourable Acting Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, last week when we had these um, questions, the Premier said his Chief of Staff had many, many conversations with many people, and he wasn't briefed on all of them, which I, I can understand. But this is a very different kind of conversation, Mr. Speaker. This is a conversation between a sitting member of this legislature, a member of that government's caucus, and a member who was taking a break from that government's cabinet, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in the tape, the Chief of Staff has asked, about, has suggested a personal services contract for the member's wife. So I want to ask the Premier, when did he first become aware that that was part of that conversation. The Honourable Premier. Uh, yesterday, Mr. Speaker, when I heard the tape that was dropped off in this uh, at Province House, and uh, like all members of this House, I encouraged the member from Dartmouth East to release the entire conversation. The Honourable Acting Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the Premier if he can explain why his Chief of Staff would initiate a conversation with the member of Dartmouth East with respect to the idea of giving his wife a personal services contract without the Premier's knowledge and whether or not the Premier feels that's an acceptable way for his Chief of Staff to represent him with a member of this legislature and of his caucus. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I said outside this house a few minutes ago, I was unhappy with what I heard in that conversation, Mr. Speaker, but I think it's important uh, that the entire conversation be released uh, to, to the people of the province of Nova Scotia and all members of this house. I encourage the member from Dartmouth East to do that, uh, and then decisions will be made from there. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, Mr. Speaker, here we go again. Last week, we asked if the Premier's Chief of Staff offered the member of, uh, for Dartmouth East a path back to Cabinet. Today, we learned that Mr. McVictor had more to say that awful day. He said, and we quote from the record, if there's anything we can do for your wife on that side, if there's anything, let us know. Just ask the Premier directly, did he tell his Chief of Staff to say that to the member for Dartmouth East? The Honourable Premier. Uh, no. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, uh, when this all came up uh, uh, over a week ago, two weeks ago, the Premier said when his Chief of Staff speaks, he speaks for me. That is a quote from the Premier, Mr. Speaker. If he didn't say that. We have all these recordings. It's become a real gong show. It's actually getting in the way of doing <coughs> House business now, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to ask the Premier, in light of the fact his government is now turning this all over to the RCMP, does he believe his Chief of Staff should step aside until this is all cleared up? 
The Honorable Premier. Uh, no, Mr. Speaker, like all members of this House, uh, I believe the entire conversation should be released to the public, to the people of Nova Scotia, should hear the entire content of what actually happened in that conversation. The Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Or, pardon me, the Honorable Acting Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we would be very happy to hear the conversation in its entirety. However, what we have is a piece of a conversation, which is very disturbing, Mr. Speaker. It's a very serious matter when the Chief of Staff of the Premier of the Province is making an offer for personal services contract to a wife of a member of the Government Caucus, and the Premier has no knowledge of that prior to or after until yesterday, and the Premier's position is, well, you know, I'm just not happy about it. Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the Premier, does he have any concerns with the conduct of his Chief of Staff in his, this matter beyond not being happy? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Like all members of this House, uh, I encourage the Member from Dark Middle East to release the entire conversation uh, so uh, uh, members can assess it in its totality and Nova Scotians can assess it in the entire totality of that conversation. The Honourable Acting Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Premier is attempting to deflect the attention away from his Chief of Staff and his office, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the Premier, have there been any other personal services contracts given to others under circumstances in which members of his government are implicated? Good the Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I appreciate uh, that at times in this House, uh, Mr. Speaker, things get a bit uh, uh, silly, uh, to say the least. Uh, I, like all members of this House, would like to have that uh, entire conversation heard by Nova Scotians. Uh, and at no time, Mr. Speaker, have uh, we used the positions we're in for any other reason than to deliver good government to the people of the province of Nova Scotia. I want to remind. <laughs> I want to remind the Honourable Member, as soon as this uh, tape, this part of this conversation letter came into my possession, I did the appropriate thing, what Nova Scotians would want us to do, and we turned it over to the authorities. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Hi, my question uh, through you today, Mr. Speaker, is to the Minister of Health. Uh, just when you thought it couldn't get any worse at the Victoria General Hospital, <coughs> it did. Uh, bed bugs have been confirmed. A total of eight beds were infected with bed bugs in areas that house the ear, nose, and throat surgery areas, along with some of the areas for uh, general surgery. So I understand the uh, beds have been well fumigated, but we also know that it's very difficult to get rid of bed bugs. So my question to the minister is Is he able to ensure Nova Scotians and patients at the BG today that the bed bug problem is eradicated? and maybe he can provide us with a, a, an idea of what kind of protocol has been used in order to eradicate those bugs. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the, the member for the, for the question. Uh, this is obviously, uh, again, a, an issue of concern to Nova Scotians uh, who, who go to the VG. Uh, it is my understanding that as uh, soon as the problem was, uh, was known, uh, the protocol that they that they have for uh, uh, dealing with, uh, with with bed bugs or any other uh, in, in you know flies and other uh, uh, disease uh, you know born uh, bugs that uh, could impact on patients. Uh, that protocol was uh, put into uh, motion, and uh, and as the member pointed out, uh, uh, fumigation is the uh, is is the is the major part of uh, that process once uh, patients, uh, of course, have been moved to uh, safe areas of the hospital. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for, for that answer. Uh, but we all know that the bed bug problem is only the latest situation at the VG, where we've had problems with the drinking water, we have floods that are also critical issues of late. There's also the issue of mice in the palliative care unit in the spring of 2014. Spokesperson Everton McLean said today conversations to upgrade the building are underway at full throttle. On September 28, following the flooding at the VG, the minister said it's time to replace the Victoria General's sites 
uh, Centennial Building. They described it as being a very poor building and one that should not be rehabilitated. He said the timeline and the cost of replacement needs to be evaluated soon, and I'll table uh, that news story as well. So my question to the minister is simply this. Uh, where does that evaluation stand at this present time? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I'm pleased to say that uh, uh, an entire group of, uh, of people from the department, uh, the uh, Nova Scotia Health Authority and uh, the VG uh, uh, site involving uh, clinical teams uh, have been very, very hard at work. They've had some long hours uh, to put into the planning process uh, that will look at uh, the replacement for the Centennial and, uh, and, and VG sites. And, uh, during this uh, session of the House, I think we'll be here long enough uh, to be able to provide uh, Nova Scotians uh, with indeed uh, the first phase of uh, planning uh, that is required uh, for, uh, for moving those services uh, to uh, the proper site. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. With much fanfare, the Minister responsible for the Public Service Commission announced an initiative to make public service positions available for young people. He said it was a way... I, would, I wouldn't quite clap yet. He said it was a way for young people to begin their careers in the public service. Can the minister please tell us how many of these positions are actually full-time positions and which ones will provide more than one year experience? The Honourable Minister of the Public Service Commission. Mr. Speaker, all the positions are full-time positions. Some of them are contract, other ones will continue on in a career. Mr. Speaker, I'd also like to add, in the last two years, the Public Service Commission has added 1,000 FTEs that are under the age of 35 with little to no experience. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure if the Minister understands what a contract position is. You know, the Minister has boasted about the creation of these jobs, but only 40% of the jobs posted on Tuesday are actually term. And I have the document showing that. The job postings close December 1st, and these term positions end in October 2016. Mr. Speaker, that isn't even a full year of employment. In fact, some will only last six months. My question is, will the Minister admit this program is nothing short of political window dressing and the program is not exactly as led as he led the public to believe? The Honourable Minister of the Public Service Commission. Mr. Speaker, I do know what a contract position is and I do know what a term position is. As I said before, Mr. Speaker, there are 1,000 new people working in the Public Service Commission under the age of 35. Mr. Speaker, when this announcement was made, this announcement was not about what we're going to do. This announcement was what we have done, and we have taken away the requirement for anyone applying to the Public Service Commission to have two years of experience. Another thing I can say, Mr. Speaker, is I've met many of these new employees in the Public Service Commission, and you know what they tell me? Under a previous government, they wouldn't have had their opportunity. The Honourable Acting Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question for you is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, in August, the public learned that the Premier's Deputy Minister of Policy and Priorities, Bernie Miller, is taking advantage of a special loophole to avoid paying his fair share of provincial income tax, Mr. Speaker. At, the time when, at a time when students are being asked to pay more, when health care workers are being asked to make do with less, and when screen workers are being forced to move away after the loss of the film tax credit, the public is disappointed by this double standard. So my question to the Premier is this. Why is his Deputy Minister receiving a special tax break at a time when the Liberal government is cutting programs and services across the province? The Honourable Premier. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I want to assure all Nova Scotians uh, he is not receiving a, a tax break, Mr. Speaker. He is paying his tax in the province of Nova Scotia. And I also want to remind the Honourable Member it was this government uh, that uh, changed uh, the, the tax position that was there to recoup over $20 million uh, from those who were being paid uh, through, uh, through stock options or equity, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so we're continuing to work with Nova Scotians who are investing in our communities. I'm uh, very pleased with the, with the work that our government has been doing to ensure that all Nova Scotians are being treated fairly. The Honourable Acting Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. According to economist Lars Osberg, Mr. Miller is able to save over 30% on his taxes because he is registered as a corporation. And I'll table that, Mr. Speaker. According to the contract between the Prem Premier's Deputy Minister, a company called Bernie Miller Services PC Inc., which I'll also incorporate, it, um, incorporate which I'll table, my question to the Premier is this, can he please explain how it's acceptable to have his Deputy Minister registered as a corporation and not pay taxes his fair share as a civil servant? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to remind the Honourable Member that the, the, the premise of her question is completely wrong and inaccurate. Uh, Mr. Miller is paying his taxes in this province, continue to do so, Mr. Speaker. Uh, very pleased with the work he's been doing on behalf of uh, Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, when you get high-quality individuals who want to come provide some level of public service but not join the public service, Mr. Speaker, it's a shame. It's a shame, Mr. Speaker, when opposition members only criticize those hard-working Nova Scotians. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment. With the end of 2015 fast approaching, so too is the provincial commitment to ensure by law 12% of the land in the province is protected and by policy 13%. On December 11, 2013, the Minister of Natural Resources, the Member for Yarmouth, stated in this House, quote, we settled on a 13% target. That is a target this government remains committed to unequivocally. Mr. Speaker, will that target be met by December 31st? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you uh, to the member for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the commitment uh, to our eggs by goal of uh, protecting at least 12% uh, of the land in uh, Nova Scotia uh, is uh, still on target. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the other day in the legislature, the Premier reassured members that his, man, his new mandates reflect the party's election promises. On October 1, 2013, the now Premier wrote, quote, we voted in favour of the amendment in 2012, What's, uh, which stated at least 12% shall be protected, and now that target has reached 13%, and we fully support that measure. Mr. Speaker, will the 13% be met and when? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the 13%, just to clarify for the members uh, of the legislature, but also uh, for the members of the public, Mr. Speaker, uh, the difference between the uh, EGSBA goal of 12% and the 13% being uh, referenced uh, is actually a reference between two different uh, documents. The EGSBA legislation, which uh, dictates uh, the at least 12% uh, by the end of uh, 2015, uh, the 13% came from a uh, document, a report uh, plan prepared uh, jointly between the Department of Natural Resources and Nova Scotia Environment. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, we continue to work on that plan. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Premier defends his Chief of Staff by stating that we only have pieces of two different conversations. And Mr. Speaker, that is correct, although it's all we have to go on at the moment. The member for Dartmouth East is here and has been answering questions I know about his side of a conversation that included two people, the member for Dartmouth East and the Premier's Chief of Staff. I'd like to ask the Premier to clear this all up. Will he bring his Chief of Staff over to answer questions from media today about his role in those conversations? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for the question. Like all members of this House, I encourage the Member from Dartmouth East to release the entire conversation, and I'm sure, uh, I'm sure the uh, uh, Chief of Staff will be able to respond to the entire conversation. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, there is no good reason why the Premier's Chief of Staff could not come over here and clear this all up right now by explaining his role in this conversation that included two people. In fact, Mr. Speaker, the Premier has said that the Chief of Staff speaks for him. Why won't he let his own Chief of Staff speak for himself? The Honourable Premier. 
Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for the question. I thank him for the support that he provided to ensure that uh, the Honourable Member Dark of the East provides the entire conversation so that all Nova Scotians get a chance to look at it in its totality. The Honourable Member for Pictou East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of Energy. If Nova Scotia Power fails to meet performance targets, they could face a fine of up to a million dollars. For context, the company made $125 million last year. So my question for the Minister is, how did the Minister determine that the threat of a fine of up to $1 million was appropriate for Nova Scotia Power? The Honourable Minister of Energy. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The fact is that after we were elected, we undertook a review of our electricity system in which 1,300 Nova Scotians were able to tell us exactly what they wanted to see from electricity plan moving forward. And four themes came out very clearly predictability, stability, innovation, and accountability. And on the accountability side, Nova Scotians clearly said they want to see Nova Scotia Power have clear performance standards, and if they are not able to provide those performance standards, that they should face a penalty. So, Speaker, prior to this, there was no mechanism of putting that type of penalty in place. I think Nova Scotians will find it significant that the company could be faced with a bill of up to a million dollars a year if they do not meet performance standards. The Honourable Member for Pictou East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I absolutely agree that they should be facing performance standards and they should be compelled to meet them. I'm just questioning how, how the million dollars was determined by the government because there's still a lot of questions around this. It's not clear if the million dollars is per incident or per year. It's unclear where the money will go once it's collected. It's unclear what the penalties will be even in the first place. It could be up to a million dollars, but we need a few more details. So. I guess my question for the Minister today is, can the Minister answer these types of questions for us today, or are we all making up as we go along? The Honourable Minister of Energy. Well, Mr. Speaker, we released a 25-year plan uh, that outlines all this, so if the member hasn't had a chance to read the plan yet, I would certainly encourage him to do so. It's available online, and he can see it for himself. Not only is there accountability standards that will be put in place, Mr. Speaker, but now that the Utility Review Board can find them up to a million dollars a year if they don't meet performance standards, here's what's most important. That million dollars will be paid by shareholders of Nova Scotia Power, not by ratepayers. Not only that, Mr. Speaker, that million dollars paid by the shareholders of Nova Scotia Power will be put towards the fuel charges of the utility, which will be then passed on as a savings to Nova Scotia ratepayers. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Sexualized and gender-based violence is an all-too-often occurrence on our post-secondary campuses. It's a reality that creates barriers for students to learn and fully participate in their classrooms. It's also a reality that deserves the full weight, Mr. Speaker, the full weight of the law to combat effectively. So I'd like to ask the Minister, does the Minister agree that enshrining measures to combat sexualized violence into legislation is an appropriate action to demonstrate how seriously we take this issue? The Honourable Minister of Labour. Uh, I want to thank the Honourable Member uh, for the question, and uh, I, do, I do want to actually take a moment to give credit to the students across this province who this fall ran a number of different uh, programs that would help young people realize when they landed on campus, um, realize details around what consent means, Mr. Speaker, and, and gave them an opportunity to actually learn about sexualized violence, Mr. Speaker. What we do want to, want to be very clear, Mr. Speaker, is that there are laws around sexualized violence, Mr. Speaker, it's called the criminal code. Thank you. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, we know in recent meetings uh, the Minister has had with the students and student organizations that it's her will to move that into the MOU that will be coming forward, Mr. Speaker. I have correspondence from over 1,584 Nova Scotia students who co completely disagree with that approach of the Minister, and I'd like to table those for the House today, Mr. Speaker. They've been telling the Minister for months that the upcoming university MOU is not an appropriate place to address sexualized violence. Students are concerned that the issue will be marginalized if the only language that speaks of sexualized violence is contained in a document like the MOU, which expires. So if students are telling the minister that legislation is most appropriate, why is she refusing to take advice 
from the very people who are on the front line of dealing with sexualized violence on campus. The Honorable Minister of Labor. I want to thank the Honourable Member uh, for the question, and I want to thank him for bringing that bill forward. It, uh, I think we all uh, want the same thing at the end of the day. I do have some concerns about the bill, which I've articulated to the students. One of the things is that they've asked for, for example, is that they would like um, uh, mandatory online reporting. And what's very clear from what I have heard from uh, officials in the Health Department, for example, when you have that kind of reporting, you can often identify uh, people if it's in a small jurisdiction. I've articulated that to the students. Uh, I understand they may disagree with me on that, but Mr. Speaker, I have to do what I believe is right. I don't want to put any more young people in jeopardy, so I want to thank you for that. <clears throat> Just to provide a clarification, question period will conclude at 3.01 p.m. I had uh, given the incorrect time earlier, so 3.01 p.m. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I guess sometimes questions in this House are about the long game. So in the last two sessions of the House, I asked the Minister of Health an update on the province's coverage of at-home oral cancer medications. To pay out of pocket for these medications is impossible for many families, and it adds additional stress and hardship for them after a cancer diagnosis. Last fall, the Minister told the House that his department was conducting a cost analysis of providing coverage for at-home oral medications for cancer. Last spring, the minister said that there were, were oral cancer drugs that would be, or that they would be putting on the provincial formulary. So can the minister provide an update on the cost analysis performed by his department and a timeline as to when cancer patients can inspect this coverage? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'm pleased to say that uh, uh, in our province, uh, those who need uh, oral uh, cancer medications uh, uh, do have a, a number of our programs that, uh, that provide uh, coverage, and uh, that, uh, that, in fact, uh, it meets the requirements of many of our patients. Uh, there are occasionally those that uh, do have a little bit of trouble uh, accessing uh, the full coverage. Uh, we're also very, very fortunate that uh, uh, the vast majority of the companies that, uh, that make these uh, medications uh, also provide some compassionate uh, relief in terms of the full cost that it would uh, uh, provide, that it would need for the province. We would be in the 40 to 50 million dollar range uh, if we were to cover all of the oral medications today. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I thank the Minister for his answer, uh, but at the same time, there are families and individuals in this province that uh, can use that kind of treatment uh, that not only helps them at home and helps them with their cancer, but also keeps them out of the hospital system, thus saving some money. So recently, a father shared us a, a story of his daughter's struggle regarding coverage of her oral cancer medication. His daughter is a university student and is having great success with her medication. She receives coverage, as the minister says, through her university uh, plan, but fears that once she enters the, uh, the job market, she'll no longer be able to afford her medication. They fear that for her health, will suffer as a result. And of course, what father wouldn't fear uh, for their child? What assurances can the minister provide families in this situation? When can Nova Scotians expect coverage? for medications like oral medications. For the cancer. Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And it is a very important uh, subject that's been uh, raised by the Honourable Member. Uh, in fact, I'm very aware of the case that uh, he has uh, referenced uh, here. And uh, knowing her uh, future uh, occupation, uh, certainly coverage as well will be there for her. But in terms of, uh, you know, that uh, global way of dealing with uh, oral uh, medications, uh, there are a couple of provinces in Canada that do cover now. And uh, it's one of those uh, topics that I know uh, will get uh, further debate at the national level uh, now that there is a strong interest in those, uh, in those issues. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Studies have shown that the first symptoms of mental illness often present themselves in adolescence. This is a critical time because it's the age that many young Nova Scotians leave home and attend universities and colleges. We know that mental health needs of university and college students can be different than the needs of junior high or high school students. 
So my question to the Minister is, what steps has the Minister taken to ensure adequate mental health services for university and college students, and is she currently working to have all Nova Scotia colleges and universities provide appropriate support such as a transition resource developed by Dr. Stan Kutcher and his team? The Honourable Minister of Labour. I'd like to thank the honourable member for the question. Uh, yes, indeed, Mr. Speaker, this is a, a, an issue that I've been hearing about, not just from um, uh, students themselves, but in fact, as I've been making my university uh, rounds, I've been hearing about this from uh, faculty. They've indicated to me that they are seeing far more uh, mental illness among the student population than they've ever seen before. And Mr. Speaker, that's why this is one of the elements that we're working with the university presidents in the MOU. Thank you. The honourable member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that answer. Young people aged 15 to 24 are more likely to experience mental illness and or substance abuse disorders than any other age group. Now, I can table that article, Mr. Speaker. If untreated, symptoms of mental illness and substance abuse use disorders that present themselves in adolescence can lead to even more serious problems down the road. So my question for the Minister, could the Minister inform the House how much funding is directed towards treating and supporting young people with substance abuse issues in Nova Scotia's colleges and universities? The Honourable Minister of Labour. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I, I, I don't have the, the numbers at my fingertips, but I'd be most happy to get it for him. Uh, I would also like to say that uh, I have a great deal of respect for uh, Dr. Stan Kutcher, and it is my hope that in the future we would be able to work with him on something of this nature. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development. The Auditor General's report released yesterday noted that her department sometimes requests that information that is shared with board management be embargoed and not shared with the governing boards for several months. Mr. Speaker, this government's promise to be more open and transparent appears to be rather hollow. So my question for the Minister is this. Why is her department sharing information with unelected bureaucrats while keeping information secret from elected boards? The Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. I think it's, it's important to, for all of us to recognize that we have a responsibility to maintain uh, confidentiality and privacy uh, with the student data until, in fact, uh, it is ready to be shared with the parents. We want uh, the boards and their senior staff to do their diagnosis of the, of the results and to look at uh, how that will impact on the delivery of services in our schools. And uh, when that information has been assessed and when it has been uh, um, identified as to what the next steps would be, then that information is shared with the elected board. But first of all, it's shared with the parents. The Honourable Member for Toro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I'm to take from that reply that it's only to do with the children and nothing else that is being kept from the elected board members. So I would suggest that they perhaps look into that themselves. Mr. Speaker, the Minister has admitted, and I quote, it is an unfortunate accepted truth that we have fallen behind in educating our children in Nova Scotia, and they in turn have fallen behind their peers nationally and internationally. I'll table that, Mr. Speaker. Yet yesterday we learned from the Auditor General's report that the Minister's Department has not established education performance standards for school boards or performance targets for provincial assessments. Therefore, my question for the Minister is this. If she knows our students are falling behind, why hasn't her department established standards that outline where our students need to be? The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to the member opposite. Uh, I think it would be misleading for anyone in this House or anyone in the public to accept a premise that we do not look at and try to improve student outcomes across the board. <clears throat> And I would, I would go on to say, Mr. Speaker, that one of the ways we're doing that is to reinvest $65 million that was cut by that crowd over there and programs were taken away from them. The Honourable Member for Hans West. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Spe Mr. Speaker. At a uh, recent meeting of safety leaders in the province, concerns about the high rate of injury among health workers in Nova Scotia was raised. And recently, a nurse and several security guards at the Hans Community Hospital uh, in Windsor uh, 
were assaulted. I would like to ask the Minister of Labour what is her department doing to reduce injury among health care workers. The Honourable Minister of Labour. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sta Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I was at that particular uh, safety meeting, where, and I would like to commend uh, Janet Hazelton and uh, Ms. Jessam for, for bringing up this particular issue. There is no doubt there is a high rate of injury among health care workers, Mr. Speaker. In, over the last couple of years, we've been focusing most of our efforts around industries that uh, had a high rate of death. So we are talking things like the fishing industry and the construction construction industry and we've been working uh, to do uh, targeted inspections, that kind of thing, to bring down that rate. Uh, our neck, we are now beginning to focus, Mr. Speaker, on uh, the health care sector. It's a big sector. There's a high rate of injury and I thank the Honourable Member for the question. The Honourable Member for Hans West. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for those efforts. Um, there's been some rumor that there'll be a change in the way security works around at least that facility. Is that correct, or is there a general plan across the province to change um, security that has been changed, I think, a few years ago from what was then the commissioners were in place at one point. At some hospitals, if not all, we went to a private security uh, at the Hans community some years back. Is there a change or uh, some consideration uh, for change of foot? Honorable Minister of Labor. I, I thank, thank the Honourable Member for the question. I think that might actually come under the Department of Health, that part of it, but uh, I do want to assure the Honourable Member that this is something that the Department takes very seriously. We know that a lot of the injuries in the health care uh, in the health, health care um, sector uh, are, you know, from lifting, etc. But we also have to be uh, cognizant of the fact that some of our health care workers are at risk uh, from the public, and there's there's going to be a concerted effort around education and a variety of different measures to make sure that this this is dealt with. Thank you very much. The honourable member for Inverness, Sir, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Transportation. On November 12th last year, I asked the government about the Crowdus Bridge in Marguerite Valley, about whether they would consult with local people about replacement of this bridge. There was no consultation. Consultation would have revealed the importance of Cranton Bridge, another crossing in the area. There are over 20 organizations that will be affected if that bridge closes. If this government is not closing Cranton Bridge, why won't they maintain this asset? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for the question. Uh, I, I certainly wouldn't agree with the idea that we haven't consulted on Crowdis or on Cranton Bridge. I know uh, Steve McDonald, uh, that represents TIR, the very local level there, who the member has a good relationship with, uh, has been uh, well apprised of the, of the situation, uh, well apprised of what's required there from the transportation uh, needs in that particular area, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we've, we've invested a significant amount of money in the Crowdis Bridge. Uh, we've recently indicated, uh, as recent as a couple weeks ago, that we wouldn't be closing the, the Cranton Bridge and that we'd be looking at the necessary repairs, so we're just looking at the costing and the estimates that will go into that, Mr. Speaker. We've heard loud and clear from the community they don't want the Cranton Bridge closed. We respect those wishes and we'll do what we can, keep it open and do those required renovations. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, thank, I want to thank the Minister for the answer. It sounds positive. Uh, Mr. Speaker, many in the community have indicated that they would have been satisfied to see Crowdis as a one-lane bridge, and that would have saved government money, which could then be used to maintain Cranton Bridge. Uh, when governments listen, Mr. Speaker, better decisions are made. Infrastructure feeds the economy, but so do businesses that depend on that infrastructure, and I think consultation would have revealed that. My question, will the government accept responsibility for not consulting with the people of Marguerite and regularly budget funds to maintain Cranton Bridge. The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, uh, when, I, when I went to the Crowdus Bridge with Lori Cranton and with the member opposite, uh, I think that's a pretty reasonable amount of consultation, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker. We have the MLA, we have someone in the area who represents the wishes of the people, uh, for my opinion and what I, I know about Lori. Um, we talked about the Crowdus Bridge. I don't recall a, a specific mention and an idea that would, would be one lane. But, Mr. Speaker, what's invested in, in Crowdus is good work. Uh, it's being completed. We've got a, we, we're working on the plan for, for Cranton Bridge. We understand the impact on the community the fire department, the local businesses who would need this to be open, Mr. Speaker. We're listening loud and clear. We hear the wishes of the community. We're going to fulfill our obligation to do what we can to help the community.
community, Mr. Speaker. I'm not, I'm not sure what more we can do, uh, but I believe that when I'm there on the ground and seeing these infrastructure pieces in place, I think that's pretty good consultation. Thank you very much. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much. Uh, my question now is uh, to the Minister of Fisheries. Um, as lobster season is soon to get underway for Districts 34 and 33, uh, efforts to coordinate marketing Nova Scotia lobster has been undermined with pure, poor coordination, some confusion, and uh, a lack of leadership. So my question to the Minister is, why has the government fallen so far short in providing leadership and support to the lobster industry? The Honourable Ministers of Fisheries. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the member for the question. Indeed, we have not fallen short. We have uh, record sales of live lobsters at very high prices in China that have never been seen before, and we will continue to promote that market and other markets as we move forward. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, credit can be given to the industry for doing some hard work to make sure that they're opening up markets. While this government continues to not do a levy, not talk to the people that they're supposed to be talking to, uh, not doing the work that they need to be, need to be doing. Uh, so my question really revolves around uh, the minister is going, the premier is going to Asia and those places, uh, while the government's failed to show leadership locally. Uh, so when is the levy going to be put in place? Is it not going to be put in place? Uh, because the community themselves are still wondering what the heck's going on. The Honourable Minister of Fisheries. As the member will recall, uh, this legislature passed, and I believe your, your party voted for it as well, the uh, law that, uh, that allows us to uh, collect a fee or a levy, whatever you want to call it. And uh, indeed, uh, the industry has the ability now to move forward and contact us if they want to move forward. There's a lot of, dis a lot of discussion in the communities about that, and we will continue that discussion. And uh, until we do that and, get, and the industry is ready, it's up to them. The Honourable Acting Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, through you, my question is for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education stood on the floor of the House and flatly denied that university tuition is uncapped. Mr. Speaker, she said, tuitions are not uncapped. That seems to be a myth. They are not uncapped. And Mr. Speaker, I'll table the Hansard. So I want to ask the Premier, does the Premier agree with his Minister that tuition in Nova Scotia is not uncapped? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. I want to tell her that I agree with the Minister and the great work she's doing on behalf of students across this province. We're very fortunate, We're very fortunate Mr. Speaker, to have the post-secondary institutions that we have in this province. Uh, it's amazing to me to watch not only uh, uh, people who work at those institutions, but students who attend them celebrate the fact that we finally get rid of a government that didn't respect public post-secondary education. The one that has invested in Mr. Speaker, and we're continuing to see, Mr. Speaker, the, the student population grow at those universities. We brought in, Mr. Speaker, public policy positions that will allow those Order, young people... Please. The Honourable Premier has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to work with uh, students and uh, faculty who work at those institutions to ensure that those young people who, who, Mr. Speaker, bet on Nova Scotians by showing up here to go to university, Mr. Speaker, and stay here to go to university, will work with them to provide them a future in this province, Mr. Speaker. One, quite frankly, that was ignored by that crowd. The Honourable Acting Leader of the New Democratic Party. I wish the minister, the premier, was half as angry about the rising tuition increases in the province and the impact that's having on students, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, NASCAD Order, tuition Order, is... please. The Honourable Acting Leader of the New Democratic Party has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, NASCAD tuition is scheduled to increase by as much as 37 percent. St. Mary's raised their tuition by more than $500 annually. King's College is, at, uh, is eyeing a $1,000 tuition hike. St. Avex has increased their tuition by $500. Cape Breton University has seen more than a 20 percent increase, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the Premier, if the tuition cap is still in place in Nova Scotia, can he please explain what's going on in our universities? The Honourable Premier. Mr. 
Speaker, I, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you what's going. Mr. Speaker, I can tell you what's going on with the question. She's asked the question of the opposition as good as fin finance minister she was, Mr. Speaker, when it came to telling us whether the books are balanced. The reality of it is, Mr. Speaker, universities across this province are continuing to provide good quality education not only to our sons and daughters, but Order, sons and daughters please. across the globe. The Honourable Premier has the floor. The sons and daughters across the globe, Mr. Speaker, who are betting on this province by showing up, going to university, Mr. Speaker, wanting to stay here to great, grow good jobs, Mr. Speaker. They finally have a government that is bringing in public policy that says, we're prepared to work with you, Mr. Speaker. We're prepared to help you not only grow an opportunity for yourself, but to grow opportunities for other Nova Scotia children, Mr. Speaker, and to grow the economy so we can invest in the very things that Nova Scotians told us they want us to invest in. Order, please. Time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers have expired. We'll now move on to government business. The Honourable Government House Leader. Speaker, would you please call public bills for second reading? <clears throat> we'll now call public bills for second reading. Speaker, would you please call bill number 122, the Interjurisdictional Support Orders Act. We'll now call bill number 122, the Interjurisdictional Support Orders Act. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I... I move that Bill 122, Amendments to the Interjurisdictional Support Orders Act, be now read a second time. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to outline the changes to this act that, that are being presented here today. The amend amendments will clarify the process for Nova Scotians dealing with child and spousal support orders between provinces and territories. It will prevent an unnecessary notice requirement that would increase